to turn off your speaker. You turn off your microphone. Uh, could we please request everyone to turn off the go into mute mode? Sorry about that. I, I should have mentioned that to begin with. My apologies. Anyways, we're in this together, and uh, today we're in this particular webinar together as well, and it's a great opportunity to discuss some of uh, the important issues that not only get us to uh, greater integration of renewable energy uh, in South Asia and India, but also gets us to a place where we can think about resilience, preparing for these kinds of global crises in, in the future. Um, I want to start off, of course, by by um, saying good afternoon to our esteemed panelists and participants. My name is Michael Satin. I'm the director of the Clean Energy and Environment Office at USAID in India, based at the American Embassy in New Delhi. And on behalf of the U.S. Agency for International Development, I welcome you all to today's uh, workshop. I hope everyone is keeping safe and healthy, as I started to say. I'm grateful for this opportunity to interact with all of you today. And there are two main, main reasons that we come together today and why I'm so excited about this opportunity. First, I really want to take a moment and congratulate the government of India and the Solar Energy Corporation of India for their efforts and commitment to further the deployment of renewable energy in India. Despite all the challenges posed by the COVID-19 lockdown and its impact on economic activities, the government of India has remained committed to this initiative not only because it is the right thing to do, but they understand that going forward, if we let it fall, if we do not continue after it, then it has the potential of blowing up in our faces. And we want to make sure this happens. It happens in a in a right amount of time. So we saw some extraordinary outcomes like the successful management of power systems during the nine minute event on April 5th. This showed the resilience and flexibility of the power system to take on a significant amount of variable renewable energy um, uh, or demand. Uh, SESI concluded that the first RTC tender of 400 megawatts with a historic low first year tariff, the real time power market was launched and several new initiatives were announced to support renewable energy, like for example, the amendment to the Electricity Act of 2003, a big step forward for India that will have ramifications across the region. The second reason we're excited about today is to reiterate the commitment of USAID to support India's renewable energy revolution and even supporting expanding this to other parts of South Asia through our new Asia Enhancing Growth and Development Through Energy, or as we call it, the Asia Edge Initiative, a significant pillar of the US Indo-Pacific strategy. Interestingly enough, or perhaps not too surprising, but certainly the case, the U.S. and Indian governments have had a very successful partnership over a long time in the energy sector, going back to the 1950s. In 2009, our two governments established the U.S.-India Partnership to Advance Clean Energy, more popularly known as PACE which was implemented in collaboration with the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, the Ministry of Power, and other government of India agencies. Through the PACE-D program, USAID was able to make significant contributions to India's renewable energy journey, including solar resource assessments, investment in the first gigawatts of the National Solar Mission, building the ecosystems for green bonds in India, and supporting the widespread deployment of rooftop solar. All of these are benchmarks that say we're going in the right direction and we're moving at a reasonable pace, a pace that we want to accelerate now going into the future. And that's a part of what today's webinar is about. Today's webinar is being organized under the second phase of the PACE-D program implemented in partnership with the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, the second phase of PACE-D or PACE-D 2.0, as we call it. PACE-D 2.0 renewable energy is designed to help, st help states take advantage of the economic, environmental, and technical systematic benefits offered by renewable energy, prepare DISCOMs for the transition to a new energy paradigm, and, as you might imagine, improve markets for private sector investments in renewable energy technologies, a very incredibly important part of this whole renewable energy revolution. This will be achieved by making renewable energy technologies more economical and reliable to meet India's energy and economic security objectives. 
And the program has interventions in three separate but interlinked components. Let me tell you a little bit about them just to get your taste buds working. First of all, strategic energy planning. This is meant to improve renewable energy procurement planning by DISCOMs through rational renewable energy target setting, improving understanding of value propositions of renewable energy to DISCOMs business and service delivery, and establishing robust demand forecasts and renewable energy resources plans to optimize power systems at the least cost. Of course, this is always about making sure it's efficient. Least cost, best provision, accounting for the contextual environment. The second piece of this is scaling the grid-connected distributed photovoltaic. This component will help DISCOMs realize the benefits of distributed renewable energy resources. And thirdly, but certainly not last, just as important, innovative procurement of renewable energy technologies. One of the most important things we're gonna do in the next several years is to make sure that the financial industries and that private sector and those who are interested and motivated to get into this area have the resources available, the capital, that they can go out and make these investments and plan for the future. One important global trend has been the increasing use of auctions. As policymakers seek to procure renewables, based electricity at the lowest price while fulfilling other objectives. And right from the start, I'll be the first to admit, India has adopted auctions in its strategy for the national solar missions and expanded it to other renewable energy technologies as well, leading to record-breaking low prices for solar and wind technologies. Leading renewable energy countries, including India, are focused on the design of auctions to achieve objectives beyond the least cost of renewable energy generation through solar wind hybrids, round the clock, renewable energy with energy storage to drive the cost of renewable energy to the system. So I'm incredibly pleased that today we have Mr. S.K. Mishra from the Solar Energy Corporation of India. Mr. Mishra, we are so grateful for your engagement with the PACE D2.0 Renewable Energy Program and driving system-friendly procurement of renewable energy in India. PACE 2.0, worked with CC to evolve the concepts, bring international experience, create awareness among key stakeholders on, on these new procurement options. In November 2019, the PACE 2.0 program released a white paper on system-friendly renewable energy procurement in India. As mentioned, before I am so pleased, India has already moved ahead with the RTC tenders at scale. PACE 2.0 is currently working with Indian railways to help them adopt new procurement approaches to meet their energy needs through renewable energy. Think how incredible it is in a country where rails are some of the most prolific and widespread forms of transportation, and that the property owners that are Indian railways have investments all over the country in the form of not just rails and trains, but buildings and warehouses and residential properties accounting for their staff and making uh, life for their, their team that much better. We plan to be a part of Indian Railway's future. Today, we hope to drive discussions on the RTC tenders by hearing the perspectives of various stakeholders like SECI project developers, distribution utilities, development finance institutions, and an international expert. I hope this will bring more insights on how to further improve system-friendly procurement in India. So let me just conclude by saying, that our many successes have been based on partnerships, on a shared vision, on value and on trust. This is true across the board. USAID and the American government with, with the government of India and its various components, as I mentioned, Indian Railways, Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. We look forward to continuing this partnership and working closely with MNRE, our partner states, and all of you to achieve significant results in support of India's clean energy goals. So with that, let me just say thank you all for joining us. And let me be a bold to again, wish you the best, the healthiest uh, and the safest future for you and your family. And with all of that, I look forward to a robust discussion today and uh, presentations. And I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Anurag Mishra from USAID India, who will present some of the elements of the RTC tenders to set the context and provide some background. Anurag, over to you, buddy. 
Thanks, Michael, uh, for providing the background. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so this presentation is put together to kind of lay the ground for the discussion with the set of panelists we have. And I'd like to kind of speak to uh, uh, how system-friendly procurement to round the clock can play an important role in India achieving its uh, large renewable energy target. So uh, I will try and kind of quickly go through some of the initial slides, uh, which just kind of set the context, and a lot of us are quite aware of uh, India's progress so far. We already have achieved significant deployment of renewable energy in India. Around 90 gigawatts is deployed. And in the last five years, we have seen that pace of deployment has increased. But on the other hand, uh, we also saw that the uh, it has also driven the cost of uh, solar and wind uh, coming down, and which has made them really cost competitive with and uh, coal. With the strong support from all the stakeholders, India has now uh, the most renewable energy development ecosystem in the world, and which is critical for India as we try and move towards 175 gigawatt goals and a uh, future goal of 450 gigawatts by 2030. Uh, as we kind of significantly increase uh, the renewable energy mix in our total capacity, uh, it will have impact on different sectors and constraints. And that is what uh, I'd like to speak to uh, in my next couple of slides. Uh, but before I do that, I think just a kind of a reminder, where do we stand in terms of coming to a place where uh, India's economic growth is driven through a clean and renewable sources of energy. Uh, we have already achieved uh, cost competitiveness, and now we are at the stage we are kind of trying to integrate renewables into the system, and that is where the whole discussion of system-friendly procurement, round-the-clock power, or other ways of kind of uh, improving the uh, flexibility in the system uh, kind of uh, comes into play, and that is where we're going to discuss uh, most of the issues which are coming up on the stage. Uh, if you are able to kind of uh, resolve these issues uh, in a cost-effective way, we can definitely move to the next stage as we all are planning to go to that. Uh, the three attributes of renewables, uh, variability, uncertainty, and location specific, are the three critical challenges for renewables to meet round the clock power requirement. And we today will discuss uh, how uh, innovative uh, procurement approaches can kind of drive that by providing a combination of technologies to provide uh, round the clock power through renewables. Uh, we have a number of issues. Uh, uh, which have emerged based on the current approaches. I will not say that the current approaches were wrong. They were really important for us to come to a stage where we have a significant deployment of renewable energy. We also have driven a significant uh, cost reduction. But if you continue on these steps, uh, we will face a lot of challenges. And I highlight a few. The first is, uh, as we increase the deployment of solar and wind, which are the highly variable renewable energy technologies, uh, we will bring more variability to the system, but that also leads to a very high integration cost. Second is, uh, these will also improve or increase the burden on the grid management and operation where the grid managers have to look for more reserves, bring more flexibility through other balancing resources, build new transmission capacities, and do a lot many things that uh, variability, manage the variability into the system. The third is uh, it will also impact uh, the existing resources. As you see uh, from the right-hand side green box, uh, uh, just an example where a state which has around 2,000 uh, megawatt of total kind of a peak demand suddenly adds a 700 megawatt of solar. Uh, you will imagine what happens when the solar is generating. Suddenly, you're going to displace uh, 700 megawatt of other resources, which is almost uh, one-third of uh, the existing capacity. And that will uh, have a major impact on the existing resources, which are already contracted to serve for a number of years. <clears throat> the other uh, three challenges uh, are basically uh, the struggle which discoms and consumers will have in uh, managing the uh, variation which comes through the uh, renewable energy. And we have also seen uh, so far uh, uh, the demand side approaches are not fully utilized by these uh, stakeholders. So are there ways we can kind of use uh, planning for future renewable energy procurement, so far we have gone through uh, tenders, we will talk about the capacity, like I need this much of capacity of solar, or this much of wind, rather than looking into what is the right size of renewable energy for me to which can meet my present and future demand. 
and who are the best sectors who can kind of serve those needs by kind of helping me match my demand uh, with their supply sources. And the last point to uh, discuss is uh, while we have focused a lot on the uh, on reduction of uh, cost of generation through auctions and all, uh, but now we have to kind of move to uh, looking into the overall cost of supply to the consumers, which includes uh, the integration cost. And we are we are not really looking into uh, a kind of a specific technology or, or, or resource, but we are trying to see that we are optimizing the renewables in our mix in a way that it does not burden the consumer going forward. So uh, in this context, uh, definitely uh, system-friendly procurement provides us an opportunity uh, as one of the possible solutions to address these issues. Uh, I say that the number of benefits which are driven from uh, system-friendly procurement, uh, like uh, it will reduce burden on consumers and utilities to manage the variation which comes from renewable energy. It will also kind of uh, uh, help uh, us kind of manage uh, all our need uh, uh, depending on uh, the time or the year uh, where we need uh, different types of uh, capacities to meet our demand. It will also kind of uh, help uh, optimize the overall capacity as well as sources which are required or which may be the most uh, the best fit to uh, provide for that kind of uh, uh, demand in the system. There are a number of ways uh, the system friendly procurement approaches uh, can be adopted. Uh, I listed a few, uh, and they call differently in different places. These are kind of variations of one each other, uh, uh, like round the clock power, uh, time based procurement, uh, hybrid solutions, virtual hybrid. Uh, and uh, today we have uh, Fabian, uh, one of our speakers, who will touch on some of these uh, aspects of uh, uh, procurement, uh, bringing some of the intuitional experience to this. So uh, quickly moving on to uh, our experience with RTC in India. Uh, uh, this is very recent development. Uh, uh, Government of India has come out with the guidelines for round the clock power. Uh, SECI has done three tenders so far, uh, totaling a capacity of uh, 6,600 megawatts. And there's a huge interest in the market where we see in all the rounds of bidding, there has been a significant uh, uh, bids which have come from the market. But it also kind of showed that uh, the, the pricing has been quite competitive. And that's where we saw that very recently, MNRE kind of uh, laid a vision where they see that uh, RTC and hybrid all the news items you'll see are from India. So India is kind of leading this uh, thought process. and. Uh, actual procurement and deployment through these kind of approaches. Uh, MNRE scheme definitely uh, provides for a framework uh, which will uh, allow these kind of tenders to go forward, uh, primarily focusing on meeting the needs of, of uh, the states to meet their RPOs, but then also increase the deployment of renewable energy and achieve economic scale. Uh, it does allow for uh, technologies to be integrated, including uh, addition of uh, uh, energy storage as well as thermal. Uh, there are uh, two different ways of uh, kind of a bidding which can happen in terms of tariffs. There is a concept of uh, composite bidding and alternate uh, tariff mechanism. And we will hear some of this from our speakers uh, who have participated in these tenders as well as the one who actually designed uh, uh, the SECI program. And then uh, the SECI program, which has gone through three rounds of procurement uh, already. Uh, Two are kind of close, already awarded, and the third one is under procurement, uh, where we see that uh, there is been a kind of a variation of options which are adopted, like for example, the first tender for 1200 megawatt of ICS, uh, where uh, it was focused more on supplying uh, uh, peak hour renewable energy with energy storage. The next round, uh, which is more recent one, is to provide 100% renewable supported by energy storage around the clock. So not just focusing only on peak hours, but then uh, only the kind of, you can get this power throughout the uh, day uh, when you need it. And the third tender, which is kind of under uh, uh, procurement right now. So uh, RTC, what it really does, it really kind of uh, take the advantages of the capacity and understanding of the developers in understanding the profiles of different technologies and uh, the availability of resources in different geographies 
and bundle them and provide that to serve the need of a customer, whether that's a distribution company or a, or a consumer. And it also integrates a, a new technologies and IT platforms to really manage that process because this is all kind of real time. There are uh, three ways uh, where we can, uh, uh, this RTC can happen. One, uh, as we have seen in India, is the flat or the continuous demand where you set a, a, a kind of a amount of power you need for the day and the developer is uh, kind of uh, can provide that uh, to meet that demand based on different results. Second is you can also decide to change uh, based on time slots. So you can decide on different capacities needed for, for different time slots. And then a developer can design their procurement. And the third one is, is kind of real time. So I think we are currently at the stage one, but there is a possibility that we can also start considering some of the other options as we go forward with these approaches in India. Uh, all of the three options which I have suggested are have certain benefits and challenges. For example, the fixed continuous demand procurement is a simple model, both for supplier and buyer. And it is also expected to receive high responses from supplier. But on the challenges side, because of these requirements, uh, it can lead to a lot of surplus uh, generation of power. And then the question of how do we can apply that power? Or if you're not really creating that much of capacity, then there's a question of how uh, it's like markets and all. Uh, the second one, a uh, little more kind of a complex in terms of design, uh, in terms of slot-wise uh, fixed demand procurement, uh, but it will definitely allow for high potential uh, to meet the peak demand. Uh, it also has certain issues, for example, uh, it's kind of comparatively complex in terms of design and could probably uh, lead to a higher uh, cost of power. And the third one uh, is also require more of a mature uh, energy markets to be in place before we really uh, try and experiment some of that. So uh, from uh, uh, the program perspective, we have laid out a number of considerations for procurement of RTC power for buyers and developments. Uh, I will not go into all the details, but definitely somewhere buyer has to decide uh, whether they would like to go for low tariff or they would like to go for high share of energy. Because we have seen from our modeling that as we increase the renewable energy share, uh, the cost of power goes up. We also have to think about uh, different procurement options or the seasonality of how much of the variation is there in the demand in terms of different seasons. For example, uh, uh, the variation in a state which is highly dependent on agriculture will have a huge seasonal variation versus uh, a consumer which is like Indian railways probably will not have that much of seasonal variation. So all of them will have uh, impact on the design as well as the response and cost for that. On the developer side, uh, definitely the consideration for the market and how liquid the market is where they can sell their excess power or buy power to meet their peak demand uh, is quite critical. But there are other kind of important factors uh, for them to consider, like uh, what are the feasible balancing options uh, for them to look into? Or also considering different geographies to really bring in uh, the resources which are complementary to meet the demand of uh, the consumer. So uh, from the project side, we have laid some kind of uh, suggestions in how do we kind of improve uh, uh, this process going forward. Currently, in the short term, we have to really think about uh, our objective of integrating renewables, but in the long term, we definitely have to think about how do we uh, make renewables 100% responsive to the demand, uh, which would require a number of other actions to happen, uh, like uh, requirements of generation curves, which have to be more or 100% uh, flexible uh, uh, curves or demand uh, to suit the need of the consumer of the discount. There are uh, other elements of uh, uh, project structure, uh, regulatory requirements, as well as procurement processes, uh, which uh, we'd like to kind of discuss in today's uh, presentation. Uh, but in the uh, interest of time, I will not go into the detail each of them. And uh, with that, I'll just kind of conclude my uh, opening presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Anurag, for sharing challenges and current approaches, as well as sharing uh, the solutions for system-friendly procurement. Um, now I would like to introduce Mr. Fabian Began. He's the Associate Director with Navigant Germany. Fabian is an expert in energy policy and power sector reform, in particular renewable energy and energy efficiency policy and energy procurement. 
He earned Ms. MS degree in international political economy from the London School of Economics. Mr. Fabian is going to provide us with an overview of international experience in round the clock and system friendly procurement and renewable energy procurement. Uh, but before he starts, I would like to request everyone to please switch off their uh, camera and uh, mute their mics. Uh, only speakers <coughs> are allowed to uh, open their mic and uh, cameras. <coughs> Over to you, Mr. Fabian. I'm just sharing the Thank you very much. Uh, this is Fabian Viga, and it's a pleasure to talk to you today. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I will um, leave out the, the video for now and, and turn it on in the presentation to make sure we have a sufficient uh, quality um, connection here. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to say, uh, share my presentation now, right? Are you sharing yours? Yeah, I'm just sharing it. OK, wonderful. Uh, you can switch on uh, your uh, video, Fabian. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much for. for Please switch off your mic. Your mic, whosoever is uh, unmuted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for, for joining this presentation on system friendly procurement um, th for around the clock um, auctions and basically looking at international examples and experiences from that. And um, I mean, we, what we can see basically is that we see um, with higher shares of renewable energy in power systems worldwide, new approaches are needed to meet these challenges in our system. There will be responses in the demand side integration part, in the grid integration, strategic energy planning, market integration, a holistic approach is needed. But particularly in procurement, there has a large role to play in addressing these challenges. And around the clock, renewable energy procurement is a major field of engagement intervention for that. So what we see that there are basically three types of benefits uh, of round the clock power procurement. And um, that's something that, that um, on the rack also a little bit too already. It's basically that renewable energy can be made more dispatchable to more closely follow the supply and demand curve. That renewable energy should become more firm, less intermittent. And this can be done through on-site measures or through different locations. And that renewable energy should um, be, more, be more managed by the seller actually, and um, that the generation management should be more in the realm of the seller, of the developer, um, that might know certain elements of the market and of, of generation patterns much better than the buyer. And I will show you a couple of examples from around the world where elements of this round the clock procurement have been implemented already. Although I have to say that few countries went as far and as were as modern in the approaches as India. So our first example is the example of Chile. Here we can say that it was a major goal of um, the buyer to make sure that the duration um, patterns would more closely follow the demand patterns of the different distribution companies. So what the distribution companies did, they basically forecasted the long-term demand patterns. They put a lot of effort in that to try somehow find out best how demand patterns would evolve over the next 15 years. And then the regulator, regulator aggregated these projected supply requirements and conducted an auction. And what was special in this case, on the left hand, you can see that they basically had um, three different supply blocks. So bidders were not just bidding to produce power all the time, but they were bidding for different blocks to which they would produce power. And these blocks were in the end, therefore, following the demand requirements of the distribution companies, not in real time, but rather the projected demand. And um, bidders could therefore achieve higher prices, for example, at, at for example, an evening peak block, where um, yeah, it might be more difficult for, for certain um, suppliers to provide power than during um, noon of the day. What we can see is that, um, that developers basically were pledging, they were promising that they would bid uh, that they would not just bid, but they would also provide power during this time of the day. And if they would not um, meet this obligation, then would have to pay a penalty. Or in this case, actually, they would simply have to provide power from the wholesale market as an alternative. 
what was the outcome of this? So you can see that actually in this auction that happened 2017, all the power that was con contracted in all the blocks was for renewable energy. And that was a an, an very new inter an interesting development because in the past, usually, um, usually is certain evening blocks or nighttime blocks were often supplied by power from, from uh, conventional sources. And in this situation, renewable energy producers and conventional sources were competing together for these blocks. But nevertheless, all the um, projects that were being um, awarded were from renewable energy sources. And the price was also quite low. So I think we can see that an average um, contracting prices were about 2.5 rupees per kilowatt hour. They were significantly lower than average spot market prices. Of course, we saw that in certain blocks, prices were higher, but the overall um, distribution of prices was still quite promising. So is Chile an interesting example to learn from? Yes, because prices were um, so, so low and, and therefore the auction was a high success in terms of um, price reduction and in terms of providing more dis dispatchable power. Um, it is a bit too early to see to what extent um, this will actually work in the practice because most of these developers are currently um, still building these projects. So we have to see whether they can really meet the supply um, uh, the, the supply needs that they promised originally. And we have to see that for being able to, to forecast future demand and therefore um, ensure that future current procurement is meeting future demand, um, the DISCOMs had to do a very elaborate process to really find out what are the demand drivers in the future and how can demand patterns evolve in the future because it should not be based on current demand, but to the demand in the next 10 to 15 years. Another example we can see is basically the case um, of Nevada and the US um, of interesting around the clock procurement elements. I think here we basically uh, see that um, the utility the state uh, in, in, in the state wanted to ensure that they would um, reach the 50% renewable energy generation target um, by 2030. And therefore, they had a PV plus storage um, procurement um, auction. Um, a situation was that in the summertime, um, the utility noticed that it would need, had a particular need um, for power in the evening hours. And therefore, basically, they had like two different types of blocks and prices bidders could bid in on. So bidders uh, pr provide on the one hand an offer for an off-peak price, basically all the other times of the year, and then an offer for an on-peak price. So knowing that they might actually achieve a higher price um, from 4 to 9 p.m. in the evening hours. And yes, exactly in the end, um, these on-peak prices actually achieved in Nevada were six times higher than the off-peak prices, um, but therefore it does ensure that they would be able to provide power through storage in these evening times. So overall prices in Nevada have been extremely low as well. So the off-peak price uh, range between 1.6 to 1.9 rupees per kilowatt hour and the on-peak price however was rather high so the price to supply power during um, the summertime in the evening was from 10.4 rupees to 12.1 rupees per kilowatt hour so what we can see here we can learn from that also here it's the case that this auction procurement was rather recent so projects are still being built what would be a way to um, reduce um, the rather high and on peak prices in summertime. I think in this case, because the on peak price is only paid in summertime, and bidders are basically forced to, to make rather expensive um, investments into battery storage um, for covering this evening peak, which are always only being like more and more um, compensated in the summertime. So I think by not maybe using this on a, on a seasonal basis, but having it all year round, actually prices could have been reduced a bit. That's also a bit similar to the situation um, in Siki for around the clock tender um, in India we've seen where basically um, there was competitive procurement um, for, for um, this 1.2 gigawatt um, ISTS connected projects with a short power, peak power supply in India. And India had also several um, peak blocks, um, so a morning peak block and an even peak block for which they basically um, had different um, different uh, with different bits and we can see that during this peak blocks the prices were considerably lower than for the off peak blocks um what we can what can be see here that it might have been i mean the the, the supply blocks that that um Siki asked for from the bidders were rather long right until 12 o'clock at night and we know that that um the more you basically uh, in, include um 
um, late uh, evening, um, late late evening um, pr um, production um, obligations. That actually, um, the longer the the storage um, components you need for that um, with the batteries, the higher the the bits, right? So it could be make so maybe for for Seiki to to look at this very long supply blocks in the evening, um, to have very precise data about that and to see to what extent maybe shorter um, blocks in the evening could reduce a bit the, the, the cost of storage and therefore reduce the overall um, bits. Another important element is of course here that bidders need to do a good job in, and the, the duration, um, the buyers as well to really forecast both generation patterns, demand patterns and what um, what PASD is actually currently doing. So this program here is actually also supporting discoms to better forecast demand patterns and therefore better assess what would be a good block in the evening, how should, long should this block in the evening be to um, provide peak power. Another interesting example is um, the idea of virtual power plants and aggregators. And if we have a look at the situation in, in, in Germany now, we can see that there basically is um, a virtual power plant um, that is um, bundling different um, renewable energy generation, demand and storage assets, and thereby virtually is providing the power of a power plant. So a control center operates these connected assets and it is um, dispatching these um, assets basically based on, on trading um, on two markets. And um, there are basically two revenue streams for these type of power plants. On one hand, there is um, the reserve market. So um, by providing reserve capacity, um, the grid operators are um, providing certain payments um, to these virtual power plants. And the second option is to simply sell power on, on the wholesale market. And um, th through basically, yeah, like operating this very dispatchable, geographically, um, um, dis distantly located power plants is in the end through some sometimes complementary um, generation profiles, sometimes different um, demand and supply situations in different different regions. It is really able to provide rather firm power, um, although it is combining rather um, dispatchable plants. Um, what we can learn from from that case of virtual power plants is that um, in, in in Germany, I think it was quite successful initially to really provide firm reserve power um, through the bundling of, of components. Um, however, what we would usually need in these cases, you would need um, a rather liquid power market or reserve market to which these, these um, virtual power plants then can sell to, or alternatively we need like long-term PPAs with large consumers that see an additional value in um, this special power and are willing and able to pay more for it. We can see that India also has some examples already and some experiences with aggregators. Um, so, for example, and, and I think it's particularly interesting that, that um, India has, through um, a, a large geographical um, um, so, um, system and variation of the system, it has actually very complementary feed-in patterns often for onshore wind at different locations or even for solar and wind at the same location. Um, some Actors already play an aggregator role in, in India, for example, SIG is already play as a demand aggregator. For state discounts to, to um, so better, better financing conditions for some of these, discounts. we can see that some of these, these um, powers, uh, power plants um, of dispatchable um, th solar uh, or thermal power or therm thermal power actually bundled currently with solar PV. And we also see that there are currently some banking arrangements between discoms to take advantage of seasonal um, variations. And the final presentation I want to do on a case is another case from, from, from an Indian example, actually, you might be well familiar of this, is the idea of physical hybrids, where basically by physically co-locating solar and wind farms and sometimes also storage um, um, elements at one location, you actually can have three examples, uh, three three advantages. You can have on the one hand, you often have a more efficient use of land. Um, you can lower transmission um, costs, and you usually have a, um, a more firm power and um, therefore reduce <laughs> From, from this Indian um, physical um, Please mute your mic. Hybrid. Sorry, made it all yours. Mute yourself. Thank you. What are learnings from the India's um, physical hybrids? Um, we can basically see that prices that were achieved in 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 Seki tenders 2008 and 2019 were rather low. 
They were only a little bit higher than um, than solar only um, tenders, but were basically bringing along much more benefits. For example, the lower um, good connection costs. Um, and there are several sites with very good and often complementary solar and wind resources available in India. Um, and we see that often, um, uh, yeah, these, these, these basically have a great potential to, to be used further. I think that the challenge might be that, that um, in the past we have seen that, that uh, by having basically applying uniform ceiling prices to hybrid uh, projects all around India, um, in some con some regions, some states, um, projects might not be competitive um, um, co compared to others. So we might there might be a case for further regional distinguish between ceiling prices. But overall, these kind of um, yeah co-location of projects, physical hybrids of wind and solar farms have done a really good job in in bringing down um, good connection costs. So what can we learn as conclusion here? I mean the uh, round the clock. Um, Principle is, is like particular to India because it is like a very modern approach, but we can see that very maybe system friendly approaches are also piloted in other countries. And um, I think there's something we can we can learn a lot from India, but also some elements might be interested to be to 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 be included in the Indian discussion as well. And the key takeaways here is that that um, yes, um, RTC procurement elements are being on the rise worldwide with uh, higher renewable energy levels. Um, a challenge is that often these elements are rather new. Um, the procurement auctions are rather recent, and therefore sometimes it's, it's this, you can make very early assumptions on the prices which are achieved in these auctions, which are usually quite promising. We cannot let make so many assumptions yet on how reliable um, these these projects were and actually supply the power we needed because many of them have not been built yet. Um, we can see the time-based incentives. Um, we can really increase the supply demand match um, and reduce the emittency of rare renewables. But that only works if we have sufficient information on how demand patterns are evolving over time. And when we have a system where we can recognize and, and, um, and, and pay for this value of more dispatchable firm supply. Virtual hybrids ag aggregators enable dispatchable renewable energy for flexible power. And hybrid projects can reduce um, the transmission costs of projects by co-locating them. It is very important that we understand that system integration of renewables is basically an area where different types of power sector markets and regulation have to work together. So yes, we can achieve a lot in round-the-clock procurement, but overall we have to have, need to have more market form, we need more liquid um, wholesale markets and other elements basically to ensure that the overall power system becomes more flexible. Thank you so much and look forward to the discussion. Thank you Fabian for this um, great presentation. Um, now I request all the uh, attendees to please share their questions in the chat box. Uh, we'll be taking up later after this uh, panel discussion. Now I request Mr. Rani Khanna to moderate the panel discussion on RTC, its meaning and opportunities for the Indian power market. Over to you, Rani. Uh, thank you, Yogita. Thank you uh, so much to our presenters for having uh, laid down the uh, context so well. Uh, what I would like to do is as follows. Uh, I have uh, a set of uh, questions which I've already prepared, but we would also, uh, as the webinar proceeds, we would also uh, request uh, the participants to provide their questions. I know some of you already have, uh, but kindly do this, uh, do so through the chat box and we'll try and take as many of them as possible uh, as of now. Uh, I would start by uh, inviting our uh, Panel uh, panelists. Uh, first of all, can I invite Mr. Misha? Uh, Misha, sir, if you uh, if you are online, can you please? Uh, uh, yes, thank you, sir. Welcome, sir. It's nice to see you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, then can I uh, uh, invite uh, Mahesh, Mr. Mahesh Vipadas? Mahesh, can you unmute yourself and, uh, if possible, share your screen? Good afternoon afternoon yeah fabian is already there thank you fabian for joining uh, mr abhishek ranjan i don't know if he's locked on and he's there uh, surbi and deepak 
Hi, everyone. Yes. Uh, so, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is how I propose to uh, and, uh, you know, uh, conduct this webinar. I will first uh, give each of you an opportunity to speak for three to four minutes. The idea would be uh, to, uh, you know, please make your opening remarks about uh, the topic of the webinar. I would also suggest a few uh, questions which I have uh, uh, for the panelists. If they can try and answer this in the introduction, it will be uh, very, very good. Uh, subsequently, what we will do is that uh, once we've gone through this one round of, uh, you know, these uh, comments and uh, remarks, we will then uh, try and take specific questions or uh, we will uh, subsequently we can have a more open discussion or take in some questions from the participants. So first I'd uh, start with uh, Misha sir. Misha sir, your comments, but before we start, I have a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of questions which if you could address as a part of your introductory remarks, one would be what in your view is the long term vision for RE in India and how does RTC play into it? I mean, you know, what do you see is the role? How does that fit into that vision? The other is, do you see a majority of the, I mean, considering the success that's there, do you see a majority of the uh, tenders that are coming out in the future, coming out uh, through uh, the RTC route? Uh, yeah, these are the two main questions. If you can uh, try and address them in your remarks, it'd be really nice. Thank you, Roni. This, uh, and, uh, before I start, I would like to for the wonderful presentation, Mr. Fabian is a wonderful presentation given by him. Earlier also, we have seen the presentation of Mr. Fabian and uh, while designing the standards, both uh, around the clock and uh, seeking power tender. So we got a lot many inputs from during that period from him also. So we are very thankful to him. As far as the Solar Energy Corporation is concerned, Solar Energy Corporation is continuously doing oh, the... Yes. Camera to this. Hello. Solar Energy Corporation is doing the tenders uh, for uh, all type of renewable forms. One is uh, solar separate, wind separate, hybrid also. Then we have started doing the special type of tenders to take to make the renewable towards the making it firm. Initially, we thought of doing the peaking power demand of the distribution agencies to be met. Then accordingly, we had a long meetings with the different response and we understood their problem. And then we brought the tenders where the uh, time limit is six, four hours in the evening and two hours in the morning, the peaking power tender requirement where the uh, developer has to give the firm power. And afterwards, uh, one of the discounts has asked, especially for the round, uh, uh, round the clock renewal, means continuously renewal only. There is no other support from thermal and all. So based on that, we have designed this 400 megawatt uh, round the clock renewal. And uh, the concept uh, initially it was based on the power base then uh, discussion with the developers and uh, different people because of the cost issues uh, then it has been converted to the energy terms. And the present tender is 80% uh, is the annual CUF and 70% uh, is the monthly CUF that uh, and uh, penalties are very huge. It is not fitting the next election where clause will not be implemented for that particular year. And in the case of uh, 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 Speaking power tender, uh, this uh, if the 100 megawatt tender is there, then 300 megawatt hour uh, daily you have to supply, 200 at the evening, 100 in the morning. And uh, there is 80 percent monthly CUF is also there. It is not no yearly CUF in all this uh, episode. So these are the ways we understood the issues. So we our ultimate aim is to make the renewal is a complete replacement of the conventional power. That is the aim. But since because of the technological issue, cost issue, we have to go slowly on that. So we thought of going in these two modes. In the next, uh, we are thinking of the what uh, uh, is chilly model. What uh, Mr. Fabian is was giving the presentation, plot wise. That also we are trying to design the tender. We have already asked for the stakeholder meeting on 22nd, where we want to take the feedback from the, all the people, so that. Uh, I may not be needing the power 24 hours. I may be needing power only for 12 hours. I have to design tender like that. But I try to make it more firm, that power, instead of uh, too much intermittency and all these issues. So these are the our thinking, and we are working on that. And as far as the round-the-clock uh, rate is very uh, good, and uh, demand uh, requirement is also people are to tender. 
but that doesn't means ki we are doing only round the clock we are doing all type of tenders yeah, every things uh, every place is different requirement currently we are working with one of the state for the their agriculture needs so that we are doing plain solar uh, for that that is also a huge capacity by segregating the uh, agricultural feeder so this type of uh, things will uh, continue to come but our main aim is to make it more firm and slowly slowly make it dispatchable power without any interruption as per demand so these are the uh, initial uh, my comments and then when question comes i will answer thank you uh, thank you so much uh, mr sir this was really uh, insightful and it, it's gla i'm glad to know that you know there is a whole bouquet of uh, Uh, you know the uh, the comments that you are looking at to serve the different needs of the uh, of the consumers and the discoms uh, if i may now take this opportunity to move to my second panelist is mahesh uh, there uh, mahesh i can't see you hello mahesh vipadas yes i'm here okay uh, mahesh uh, uh, with the overall background that has been uh, provided by the presenters and by mr sir i uh, wanted to uh, you know take you back uh, to a discussion that we had the other day and 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 uh, reconnect there and i think this is something which the audience will really benefit by you know we are uh, introducing a new a new kind of an instrument for procuring power and obviously that instrument has to fit into the overall regulatory and uh, policy framework that india has so i wanted to know your views going forward that what do you see are the key challenges that will come when you take this theory uh, or you know this concept that you have rtc and you start implementing it on the ground uh, what 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 uh, do you think developers will will face when they actually win the bid or or, or want to uh, bid for it and, and they're preparing for it what do they need to look and get more clarity on yeah uh, good afternoon everybody i think uh, what we have done in last one year is is slightly moving away from a completely variable renewable uh, project offering which is plain valley now to a slightly more dispatchable uh, slightly more smooth in terms of uh, daily generation uh, kind of an offer to the discoms which gives you uh, slightly more comfort as a as a as a procurer of power so that's i think a direction that that we have already taken in a, in a, in a right direction uh i accompanying that we also need to look at how to make this work in terms of the regulatory framework that we have today which has slight uh, bottlenecks which which would come up when we actually go and implement this project on ground uh, one of the things which immediately come to my mind is uh, the discoms definition or discoms expectation of rtc is basically if i if is if i'm going to give him 1 megawatt rtc it has to be 1 megawatt all 96 time blocks uh, in a day so there i think slightly more education of 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 discoms when we said that renewable rtc power that we are going to give there is slightly difference between what the discoms would be expecting that we have to work on that is one second from a system point of view and i like your uh, title of the webinar uh, which actually looks at into a, into a holistic manner uh, because had this uh, rtc projects which obviously require two or more technologies to be to be used in a, in a hybrid mode if they are in a co-located uh, uh, as a co-located project there are i think very few problems that one would face even from a regulatory side but what i can what i understand is at the moment we are looking at projects which could be located at two different locations uh, and theoretically they may be in two different regions also that poses a slightly different uh, regulatory challenge which needs to be addressed because we are not came across any things like this where a combined power is injected at two different injection points which could be in a two different regions and as everybody knows the scheduling happens at at the state level state boundary then the regional boundary and at the national level so where would we fit in in these two uh, injection points uh, before we get into the injection there is also an issue of access to the grid and the current regulation basically says that if you have an loa from seki you can get an uh, long term access based on that loa equivalent to that loa now what would happen is obviously when we are de designing a project for an rtc uh, power within the definition of the of the rfs there would be slightly 
or more uh, oversizing of, of individual projects depending on how the combination is being worked upon. And there will be instances where one single location would be invading the entire quantum of, of the PPA. So what would you require is the full uh, long-term access at whatever multiple injection points that you have. And current regulation in that case pose a problem and may require an amendment. And similar th thought can be about how do you going to schedule this power at two different injection points, especially if they're going to be in two different regions, because if we want to optimize on costs, you would go to a best wind re uh, resource uh, area and a, a best solar resource area, which may not be in, in, a, in a same region. So there are few hiccups that would come on in terms of regulatory side, which we will have to address as we as we go along. But I think we are moving obviously in a, in a very correct uh, direction, and this could be resolved as as we move across and as we learn more about about this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mahesh. That's uh, that's insightful. And I would, uh, as a uh, as 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 we go around, I would really uh, like it if uh, uh, Misha sir could also throw some light on the thinking that Seki has around some of the problems that you have already addressed uh, going forward in the next round. Uh, now, moving forward, I would uh, is uh, I just wanted to check if Abhishek ji is there, uh, Mr. Abhishek Ranjan from BSES. Sir, if you're there, if you can please, uh, yeah. Okay. Hi, Abhishek ji. Good to see you. Hello, Ronnie. How are you? Thank you for me uh, having me on the panel today. Oh, you're most welcome, and we're, we're very happy to see you. Uh, so now, uh, Abhishek ji, you are the uh, the third member of that very important triad that we call in this energy system, which is the DISCOM. Because at the end of the day, you are the one who has to use that power. And so I wanted to start by asking you, how do you see this new R RTC scheme? I mean, considering the fact that Vishesh has said that there is now a bouquet of possibilities that are going to come to uh, for discoms to meet your different needs but uh, how do you evaluate it what do you see uh, the benefits that would accrue to the discoms and what are the challenges uh, specifically you know i know there are you know when you get into the nitty gritty there are this, there's this 80 percent cuf the 70 percent cuf where do, where where does that leave you how do you interpret it and uh, i'd like to hear your views on those issues no, so uh, as a part have... of your introductory comments sorry as yeah. a part of your introductory comments sure uh, am i audible Yes, you're, you're completely sure. audible. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Anurag and Fabian, for your wonderful presentation and all the kinds of different models that you pro presented in terms of uh, making RE more dispatchable. You have given options like slot-wise and then real-time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes, we have moved on a long way from pure vanilla variable RE kind of product now towards kind of making them dispatchable, maybe hybrid, physical hybrids. And now we may also go towards to virtual power plant model also in near future. Now, having said that, now that we are aware that RE can be made dispatchable, it can be made firm, there are multiple ways of doing it. There are multiple ways in which you can mix them. Maybe solar, wind, storage technology, different technologies are there. In many proportions, depending upon what kind of product that you desire. And this is the beauty of RE. This is the flexibility in the RE, which can be used as I was speaking to you yesterday in the load following and, uh, you know, uh, aligning itself with the demand. And also demand also can ally with the supply. There is a flexibility on both the sides. So with this beauty, RTC product, which has come in the market is a step ahead, I will say. And uh, definitely I'll not go into the nitty gritties as of now, as you said, this is the opening remark, but RTC product on the way of establishing flexibility, on the way of establishing reliability and uh, addressing to some extent the problem of variability is a very, very good step. And uh, some good designs have been tried to be put in like 80% annual CUF and 70% uh, monthly CUF. It has to be looked into that the demand profile of different distribution utilities would be different given this nation of multiple climatic zones. So uh, the beauty of RE is it can be, uh, you know, customized basis, the requirement and uh, also optimizing upon the cost. So the ingredients, when you mix them in a particular proportion, also determine the cost. If you have very slot wise firm base load kind of power, that will be the costliest one. Second uh, is the, the, the other extreme end is complete variable RE as a must run. I mean, it changes as per the force of nature. That is the second uh, extreme. 
So in between, where do you want to uh, put yourself is also a function of what kind of cost you want to pay. So then comes the question of resource planning. What is the optimization result? What is the most important or most optimized value for you? This could be different for different distribution utility. I'll take a pause here more when we discuss. Thank you, Abhishek ji. Thank you so much. Now, uh, keeping in view that we would like to get a more uh, rounded, uh, you know, keeping a la larger view uh, of, from our panelists, uh, I'll move next to Surbi. Uh, hi, Surbi. Can you hear me? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Surbi, now you come in with a very interesting profile into this discussion because you are you're not only a, a sort of a banker, but you're also a development banker. And I know that has more roles than just looking at the IRR of uh, projects and looking at whether what, what the DSARs are. I mean, it has a more development angle to it. So uh, let me start by asking, looking at a macro picture, how do you see uh, the impact uh, of uh, RTC on the overall power market? And how do you see the impact in terms of, uh, and also how do you see the impact on RTC of the you know, of the reforms and the new initiatives that are being brought in from the power market in terms of, you know, the uh, trading, uh, you know, that's uh, opened up, you know, instantaneous trading, etc. that's happening right now, uh, real time trading. So uh, if you could uh, throw light on these and the other question I had from you as a financer, what, uh, you know, uh, 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 an RTC pro uh, project, ideally, which what Mahesh mentioned, would have multiple assets all over the place. And some of these assets might have, you know, uh, been financed earlier. You might have financed, uh, some of them might have been unfinanced. Uh, you know, so they can be of different levels of finance. So how would you look at it while financing this? What are the uh, what are the challenges you will face? And if, if, if any, and what are the, uh, uh, what will give you the assurance? Uh, oh, that's okay, a part of your Thank you so thing. much. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Rani. So um, uh, I would like to take your first question first about how it's going to be uh, shaping the wholesale electricity markets and specifically given that the real time markets have now been recently launched. So my uh, understanding is that, you know, the the standalone renewable energy is much more challenging to handle and as has been uh, multiple uh, uh, times repeated in this entire uh, webinar that renewable energy being variable in nature, we really need to make sure that how we are able to ensure the delivery to the final consumer, the distribution companies and etc. So from that perspective, when we club any kind of 2RE resources together or we bring in thermal or we bring in battery or we bring in, you know, all of them together, it's going to bring us firmer power as compared to standalone renewable energy. And uh, this is going to play an important role when we are moving forward and when we are opening up the markets. And I would say if I can deepening the markets to bring more RE projects to allow for bidding in such markets. So around the clock power supply, depending on what definition it has in, on any day, will be much better than the standalone renewable energy project in terms of handling the balancing, the flexibility re required in the system and et cetera. So those challenges, we are still maybe not there on you know uh, moving to the 100% around the clock, but it's a step towards the right direction. And from the banker's perspective, we all are in favor. In fact, we have uh, been working with uh, multiple utilities, including SECI uh, at much deeper level, that how we can bring those synergies into the system. So from that perspective, I would say that this is definitely much more wanted and much more uh, welcome approach from, the in the, from SECI and the like institutions. Coming to the second question of yours, where you talk about the financial perspective, if the assets are disaggregated and they are located at different locations. Uh, my uh, point is that, first of all, I think uh, it depends on two aspects. If you are bringing all the assets being proposed for this particular tender as new assets, then it's much easier, of course. But uh, most of the times, what we will be trying to do is, say, club the existing renewable energy assets, which are maybe not uh, dispatchable due to say high uh, 
you know, variability or lower COFs, et cetera, or maybe in the thermal projects, which are, say, not generating over last many years due to not being able to be listed under the merit audit dispatch. So there are different financials which would have already come into the picture. From my perspective, and if I can say to a bigger extent from the commercial bankers who are out there in the market, what would be most uh, important for consideration would be that how the revenue profiles from the entire project would look like our financing could be ring fenced to the assets that we are being we are supporting but when we are looking at that this project will ensure revenues and net uh, inflows of cash so that the repayments could be made the entire project has to be looked in a holistic manner so there are multiple moving parts when a financial will look at it from that um, you know perspective so i'll stop myself here and over to you ronnie Thank you, Sulbi. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, moving on, uh, we'll now again go to the next uh, panelist. Uh, Deepak, uh, are you there? Yeah, hi, Roni. I'm there. Hi, Deepak. Uh, Deepak, so, you know, uh, I will not uh, dwell upon the uh, issues that we've already talked about. Uh, basically, uh, I uh, wanted to ask you a couple of questions which were there was, uh, you know, we talked about the fact that that you know, meeting these requirements under the RTC power will require uh, an oversizing of the assets most of the places if you're looking at an only RE uh, situation. So the impact, uh, your in your view, the impact this would have on uh, you know basically this excess power uh, being put into the market, the impact of that, if you could cover as a part of your introductory responses. And the other thing which I'm really interested in asking you because I know you uh, you know you want different hats throughout your career. Uh, is, is one of that is also to look at new technologies and new ideas is, uh, you know, would uh, firm power in this environment, uh, firm power from renewables like, you know, biofuels or pumped hydro or whatever, uh, uh, create an opportunity for these uh, technologies to develop also parallelly? Sure. Thanks, Ronnie. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll uh, answer your second question first. Uh, or, or even before that, just half a minute of introduction in sense of what we believe is the way to go about it, because that would inform the other two questions. So uh, this is the first and a very, very uh, right effort by Seki to get into RTC kind of a construct. And uh, we have started, made a very good beginning with 80% annual CUF construct and a 70% monthly CUF construct. So first we'd have to acknowledge what it will do for the discounts. What it will do for the discoms is bring down their challenges by a significant uh, level. So in a typical plain vanilla wind or a plain vanilla solar construct, wherein the CUFs are anywhere between 25 to 35 percent, they are left to manage the remaining uh, 65 to 75 percent of the time blocks on their own. And even because of very limited uh, uh, sort of RE assets on the other side, on the generation side, the variability is also a lot more. And that's what we are seeing uh, uh, as a cause of curtailment, as a cause of problems, uh, as, a, as a cause of concern for discoms. But the, the, uh, the practical aspect of it is that actually discoms thankfully have a lot of assets at their hand, like thermal assets and hydro assets, which they use uh, efficiently as much as possible to control such vagaries of renewable energy. Now, with that background, when you say uh, whether hydro or uh, biomass has any role to play, obviously they have a role to play. Now, whether they have a role to play integrated with the generator at the generation end or whether discoms can actually make them play that role. I mean, that's something which can be totally driven by how uh, one bids are constructed and second, the outlook of the sector as a whole. So as uh, any of the uh, successful bidders of any any of the Seki projects, either RTC or Peak Power, one has the option to go for hydro, pumped hydro, one has the option to uh, go for battery storage. But again, what really matters in Indian context is also the pricing of such power finally. If the pricing of such power becomes so high that it is not acceptable to the distribution companies who have to serve all kinds of consumers, then any product, whatever we may say, is not worth it. And uh, I, I say it with a lot of uh, commitment uh, when I say this, because it is very much possible to make a 100% firm schedulable RE power project by, uh, and uh, again, some of the earlier speakers spoke about co-location, the benefits of co-location. Uh, absolutely, there are benefits of co-location. Absolutely, there are benefits of co-locating a lot of energy storage. But is Indian system one, 
ready for it in a way to be able to pay for that kind of investments and second do we even need those kind of investments when actually we have a lot of excess uh, assets sitting elsewhere in the system so we have to really answer some of those questions first before we really deviate a lot from what we have already found a success in as the current rtc construct uh, now coming back to your first question what will be the role or how will access power play its role so fact remains currently indian markets are not very deep they are relatively shallow but again we have a very very firm view and with the introduction of real time markets just about 15 days back it's very very uh, difficult to really pinpoint whether it is successful or it is not i believe we are moving in the right direction opening up multiple kind of frameworks to be able to trade in market to be able to deal in market and then at the same time there is a talk of ancillary service market there is a discussion on green energy products coming up in market with all the exchanges in india supportive of that kind of interventions so i do believe whatever access power sale uh, whatever access power gets generated there will be ample opportunities to be able to sell that power into the marketplace uh, uh, pricing obviously would matter as as in any marketplace and uh, yes Uh, generators have to take uh, that risk when they are bidding for these projects i'll i'll take a pause and see if there are any further questions thank you deepak for that very comprehensive reply i mean i must say that i learned a few things also i mean quite a lot for a lot of things from your answer now what we'll do is we'll go to uh, look at some international experience and i'll uh, to finish the round i talk to fabian and then we'll do some random uh, questions across the uh, panel uh, fabian uh, you studied i know that you you've done authored a number of reports uh, related to uh, your system friendly procurement you've seen the markets all over the world and what i wanted to do was put you in a tight spot a, a difficult spot which is to ask you what do you see are the best practices across the world and what do you see are uh, comparing them to what we are doing in india right now the areas that we could adopt some of those best practices from across the world now keeping keep this in mind uh, keeping in mind the fact that mr mishra has already said that we are now looking at not rtc as not the single one only product that's going to answer all the needs of the consumers or the discoms but you know where do you see rtc uh, going from here are there places where there can be improvements and uh, what uh, we can learn from uh, international experience hey yeah you right. so on thank you so much for the wonderful um statements by the different participants um thanks for putting me into the tight spot because yes i agree we have to be careful that we acknowledge that different countries have different um objectives when introducing system friendly procurement right some countries have strongly increasing um, demand or shifting demand patterns um pointing towards evening peaks maybe and um, other countries already have a lot of power um so for countries where they have like a strong increase in demand for them it is particularly important to to basically improve this um demand supply gap right while in other countries which already have excess power maybe the the intermittency of the power is more an issue then we have different countries have different situations in terms of power power system flexibility right so india has the advantage of being a very large country which is already usually helping to some geographical smoothing already and other countries in in europe for example um which are well integrated with the neighbors they can basically use this larger system to better integrate the things in the power system countries that are smaller are rather insulated are facing much more challenges and of course then is also a question how much renewables do we have in the system right do we have rather small shares or do we have it like in india increasingly very high shares and all these different like these different situations basically kind of require different approaches and what i liked about the 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 comment of of deepak right now was basically to make sure what is how much are we willing to pay for it and what is the best solution for our country for our system and that is both in terms of reliable supply but also cost efficient supply let me give you the example so i think um we can see that that um in i think there's a lot of discussion right now on on 100% renewables i think which is a, which is very good and i think in the around the clock uh, tenders ask for 100% renewables we should not forget the demand side so for example an interesting thing we see in 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 the state of new york and in, in uh, what con edison does the your american utility is that they basically have to decide we do we want to um do we do we need to expand the distribution grid 
what they did in the end, they basically had, an, had a procurement where they didn't just procure generation power, but they also procured demand um, side services and storage solutions. And therefore, suddenly, they basically had a solution where the, the, the need for distribution grid extension actually was falling. So I think something similar is here also the case. And if you if you basically have to decide is there if there's a particular time block that you know to provide generation will be very, very expensive. You can also look at opportunities to maybe even ensure that you have demand side management service during this time and therefore need reduce the need um, to fill that demand gap. So there are different different really different experiences. Um, something I also want to mention is kind of the flexibility. And I think that is an, an um, issue also that, that Sobi already alluded to when she said basically, what do we do when we basically are now merging and now are now um, aggregating old and new assets together, what are challenges from the financing side. I think this can also be, in a way, um, advantages, right? So if we see that, for example, we we have several um, projects which which maybe the PPA is not not uh, is not valid anymore, and they're looking for new new offtake opportunities. I think basically the more offtake opportunities we have for these actors, be it through aggregators that can. Um, um, Offtake this power, be it through commercial PPAs, be it through the wholesale market that is liquid enough, that is really increasing. All of that is increasing flexibility, and I think the more the more we have options for for different types of renewables and other dispatchable technologies to have different types of offtakers, the more we're actually increasing the overall flexibility in the system, and the more we're enabling um, PPAs that are shorter or also PPAs that are following eventually more more uh, real time demand right and i think that's that's something that we can we can move to in the midterm basically right thank you thank you Fabian. that's that's a very interesting take on on, on, on what's happening around the world uh, can i just uh, quickly uh, before i go back to uh, misha sir i'd like to go back to abhishek ji abhishek ji i had a question because that that uh, fabian uh, got me thinking uh, about this and I, I know that you have been a champion of uh, promoting renewables and, and you know, uh, quite a, a few of these uh, renewables around decentralized renewables. Uh, do you see uh, as a distribution company uh, to bring in more, you know, uh, you know firmness into the uh, into the pattern, uh, the distribution company acting as some sort of an aggregator of not only uh, uh, you know the renewables that are coming in from outside like for example an rtc tender but also trying to be an rtc uh, system provider in a way because you've already started doing storage at the uh, distribution level you have solar rooftop you have an understanding of how your demand patterns are changing and plus you know how much of uh, plain vanilla re you're getting over there so do you see a business model evolve possible business model evolving in the future where uh, instead of getting just uh, you know rtc path being done by a developer maybe the uh, utility can be a quasi uh, rtc aggregator like the case case an example being of germany which uh, fabian talked about now uh, thank you ronnie uh, I, I think german example being quoted is of uh, more of a virtual power plant wherein uh, the role of and the flexibility inside the distribution arena wherein you have multiple generators embedded generators as well as demand which can be flexed they coexist and this can be obviously tapped in through implementation of solution akin to like, for example, DERM solution, distributed energy resource management system by the utility. Having said that, yes, the distribution company for its own territory, the obligation given to this under the federal act for supply of economic and reliable power supply dispatch, for that, it can uh, uh, tap into the flexibility of the distribution side and blend this with the help of uh, multiple options like for example I, I, one of my uh, favorite example is uh, community storage you're talking about referring to for example distribution transformer level storages and now we are all today in the morning we had a some uh, meeting tele meeting with himanari we talked about how we can have some solar plus storage systems portable ones uh, we are trying to work with somebody uh, for uh, under MNRE scheme and also uh, use this with the, our consumer side and that will be subjected to demand response or uh, they will be visible even if they are behind the meter they will be visible to them. So they act as a component of a virtual power plant in the distribution territory. Yes, 
so the aggregator role can be played by the utility either on its own or through empanelment as we are doing in case of solar for example we are doing also playing the role of demand aggregator in the rooftop solar as you know and we are doing this as of now on our own we can also do this in terms of aggregating the demand side flexibility aggregator or we can float some tender or empanel them and ask them to give us some demand in terms of flexibility so much flexibility is required whether it is rtc flexibility or a slot by flexibility that can be done and that we are looking forward to but the very important challenge over there is to predict net demand and demand mean, net demand means the demand from the grid that is total demand minus embedded generation so that is where is the important challenge and we are working on the same third is balancing the grid or a long term re supply or the medium term re supply from outside the territory balancing that with the, uh, the the asset that you have inside your grid now that is also possible that is also we are looking into there is another project we are kindly doing with seki also that is also possible so the way of stabilizing the re could be at multiple nodes in the entire value chain starting from the generation we are talking about where the rtc tenders and uh, peak power tenders and now many other versions will come out second is we are putting it on the transmission substation recently for example as we, you might be aware fluence submitted certain bids in australia very recently about a week back replacing the transmission asset for example third is distribution side wherein the support and balancing can be provided within embedded and the distribution mv network medium voltage network so yes the distribution utilities will be very eager to play the role of uh, demand flexibility aggregator as we are also doing the playing the role for aggregating embedded generation demand or generation resources in the supply moving towards a virtual power plant scenario which is the german example over to you ram thank you abhishek ji uh, misha sir Uh, if i can uh, request uh, uh, you to uh, kindly switch on your uh, uh, lad uh, sir uh, uh, first of all i have been meaning to ask you since i heard mahesh i thought it would be better to go around uh, all the panelists but you know mahesh pointed to a number of challenges uh, that are going to be there and i know that you have a very long history of working at pgci so i'm sure you're the best person to answer this so first of all uh, you know you see those challenges which uh, mahesh has pointed out how are you addressing those challenges uh, the second question i had uh, for you sir is that uh, do you think that with rtc coming in it might actually also bring in a certain amount of uh, Uh, a second wave for the thermal assets that are uh, that are lying underutilized in the market. Uh, how, how could the RTC market uh, impact uh, those uh, those assets? Your views on those, sir? What issue has been raised about the implementation of this uh, RTC tender? This all has been addressed. I do not know why these questions are being raised. The point is that the connectivity regulation is very clear, and according to the connectivity regulation, any additional power, whether it is 400 megawatt, if anybody wants to install the more than that, connectivity regulation provides for that. There is no issue on that because they are actually setting up the plant, and accordingly, connectivity will be given to them. As far as the scheduling in different RLDC, there is also not issue. This all matter has been discussed prior to launching the tender with the respective parties. I don't find there is any issue on all these points. But as far as the uh, multi-location, there is one issue comes in the multi-location because utilization of the transmission system, what has been uh, in the case of co-location hybrid transfer, that is not getting achieved. But what if you feel that? Even they are putting the additional plants and uh, they are supplying additional power to the exchange. So at that time they are paying the transmission charges also for that period for that power. So that will also be mitigated in that respect. In future the batteries will also come. So this uh, utilization of the transmission will increase on that. The other part is RTC. The thermal assets uh, you are talking about. We have already uh, tender has been uh, launched by Sir Energy Corporation for 5,000 megawatt. We are in the Thermal uh, is uh, 39% thermal and 51% the renewable is there. So they have very good chance to utilize such type of plants. But ultimately, what matters? What the rate finally you are uh, giving to the response? If the renewable uh, overall terms, the dispatchable power can give the lower than that, so definitely renewable will uh, be promoted. There is no no other option on that. 
because the point is that we ultimately what is the end price for the power to be supplied that matters a lot the recent uh, tender of the you you must have seen the recent uh, discovery of the rate for the thermal plants and new thermal plants because you have to see that part also new and uh, stress plant there is the difference on that so that is a very high the 4.79 is approximately rate in public domain so if the renewal can match that with the uh, with the schedule level power requirement definitely renewal will be in technology agnostic tender uh, renewal will be the winner as it has happened in the chile what the fabian has uh, presented the tender was for the all the technology it is not like that it was for the renewal only it was for the thermal gas anybody can compete but all the renewal has won this uh, ultimately when numbers will matter in the future also and we i we uh, we should not uh, look in this direction ki we should go for the rtc only we should go because it it has to go as per the discoms requirement if discom says ki i need the power from power at 6 hours and balance time very well so you have to design the tender like that if discom says i need 12 hour powers only and no power at the night so you have to design power tender like that that all is possible and the next tender is flexible tender flexible uh, requirement that we are designing that will come in that direction and more or less near to chili model So this is our journey towards the uh, ultimately firming of the power and uh, with renewal, so that uh, renewal uh, as a policy of the government for 50 gigawatt we have to do. This uh, will give the great chance to renewal to integrate with the lot of capacity. That is why it is uh, that is the way we will we will plan to we are planning to do. And any regulation challenges, any technological, any uh, transmission challenges. that needs to be solved and we will solve it there is no issue and the, all the uh, concerned authorities are supporting like anything both crc postco ctu ca they all are supporting they, the, i don't find there re- any reason of worry on these aspects thank you sir thank you i think that that would come as a great uh, you know relief to everyone who is inten- who intends to uh, bid for these uh, deepak i know has been raising his hand for some time Deepak, uh, uh, over to you. Uh, thanks, Ronnie. You know, I just raised it once and kept it raised. So <laughs> thank you, bud. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So uh, you know, just wanted to add a couple more points because I know and uh, thank you, Mishra ji, for clarifying that actually we don't see any regulatory risk as such. Uh, I mean, Seki is totally uh, designed our product in consultation, so at least we, being the winners. don't see uh, such regulatory is regulation obviously would have to be uh, tweaked and fact remains most of the regulations that we have in the country are still aligned to the old way of doing things and uh, crc has made a lot of progress not to say that they have not but uh, a lot of further progress needs to be made as we have seen by introduction of rtm and stuff like that they are already moving in that direction but just two more specific points i wanted to make on this rtc uh, see one thing is uh, and and i think we need to think about these questions and if uh, this this forum can help uh, which i'm sure they you are already working with mishra ji and the seki team but uh, number one question is where is it that storage particularly the large amount of storage be best placed at is it better to tie it to a specific project and therefore then uh, extract its value in contractual terms which my personal belief and again this is not renew belief my personal belief it, it is it could be a bit limiting in the long term if we tie up large quantum of storage in our particular contract and that's what we are seeing actually happening even in our thermal projects wherein we have long term tie ups only and very limited uh, uh, supply available in open market but storage being tied up actually would have even further impact because that otherwise could be a very flexible and a very good resource for distribution companies across the country if we rather do it as a separate uh, either as a services construct second uh, is Uh, also very detailed assessment at a country level when do we exactly need large quantums of storage uh, do we need it 2 years down the line or do we actually need it 5 years down the line and uh, uh, again uh, mishra ji and his team is fully aware of looking at whatever data we have but also to this other group like the 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 audience who is there and the other participants who are there i think these are the questions unless answered uh, we we should we would not want to get into a situation where Uh, we uh, tie up discoms by virtue of products uh, projects into a long term high cost solution uh, which they may not be very happy with 
three years or four years down the line when storage costs actually become sort of uh, whatever estimates I've seen probably half of what they currently are. So, uh, so to that extent, Seki has been obviously very, very, um, I mean, uh, on the on the front foot and have been understanding all these things, designing all the tenders that they are doing. But also to the uh, to the uh, USAID team who has been very, very graciously helping India. If some of these aspects uh, you are already considering, then it would be good for uh, us as stakeholders of the sector to know what are your evaluations coming up to and what are the results and what are your sort of recommendations as an independent entity. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Deepak. I, 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 I am glad to hear that you, you have some expectations of us and we hope to address some of those uh, in the near future. Uh, but that brought, brings me to another question which I have for Surbi. Uh, uh, Surbi, you, uh, I know, and that's because I know a little bit about your work, you uh, worked uh, on this uh, conceptualizing this hybrid project in Andhra Pradesh, uh, where there yeah. was a certain amount of storage. Uh, so I just wanted to know what they, did you uh, evaluate the impact of storage as Deepak was talking about uh, at different levels? And uh, can you share some more insights on that? If, if you have that, that will help uh, the audience understand sure. the impacts. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so uh, the background is that, you know, when we got engaged with the uh, SECI on promoting the new and nascent technologies, uh, one of the uh, foremost ideas that we had in our mind is how to bring together various technologies. And there the story began uh, of combining solar and wind. And not that we invented it, it was under the discussions uh, by a couple of players already. So we just, you know, helped that firm up pretty more in terms of, you know, so that it's uh, investment uh, ready. And then wh what we tried to do was to bring battery storage solutions to it as well. So what was the role of the battery storage was being evaluated at that time at very many levels. And we know all of us know who are working in the battery storage solution uh, sector that the value stacking of batteries is still lacking in the country, not only in the country, but in most of the other uh, parts of the world as well. So what, uh, because Seki being a commercial entity, we had to take their aspects, their um, objectives also into the consideration. So the couple of uh, value stacking services that we could immediately make out of from the battery storage uh, solution was that maybe to avoid DSM penalties, maybe to avoid curtailment. And these were the two or three value services which were immediately, you know, visible uh, not that the others are not, but they are still not uh, monetized. Um, so that's why we concentrated our battery storage solution to a very small size, but it was like a step in the right direction. And I'm sure that this also contributed to the future tenders that have been coming up um, through SECI and the various policies that are being coming up through MNRE because battery storage solution at that point in time proved that it could be combined with solar, wind, etc., and can provide some value services to the market and can you know, start the journey towards the dispatchable renewable energy power. Now, uh, going forward also, there are a couple of projects that we are working along with Seki on, and uh, there are certain battery storage solutions we are planning to deploy along with them. But nonetheless, I would also like to just one more point on the table that we are also working with Niti Aayog, in which we are looking at the entire gamut of the uh, sector. We are working with Power Grid and uh, uh, CEA and Pisoko on the uh, study of the battery storage requirements at the ISTS level. Then we are also working with a couple of states, including Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, where we are doing the value stacking services. First of all, we are trying to identify if battery storage solutions are required, or even I would say the energy storage solutions are required if batteries could be one of the proposals. If that is the a way to go ahead, then what are the hotspots where this could be deployed and what could be the value stacking for those particular deployment of services? So, Country is moving very fast. Niti Aayog and MAP, MNR, all of them are very much keen to take it forward. So you'll uh, shortly see, you know, more developments happening. On the other side, the wholesale electricity markets are also being deepened. There are a lot of things that are happening. We are again supporting MOP on that. So there is a lot of buzz going around. So Deepak, I can assure you that sooner or later you'll find more feelers from the market. You'll find more clarity from the ministries and the policy and regulatory uh, bodies in the country to take this forward. Thank you, Subhi. That's that's really insightful because what you're saying is that 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 let's not look at RTC in the uh, ambit of uh, renewable storage or maybe uh, thermal. There is 
the markets are going to uh, 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 play a role in it you know basically how various value propositions of different technologies are going to play out is going to change with time how the policies are going to evolve how the regulators are going to look at it and then how the commercial entities are going to start looking at it thank you that's that's really insightful uh, before i go to fabian for the last questions in the round and maybe then we we'll take a couple of participant questions i'll go to mahesh uh, mahesh uh, as a putting your hat on as a developer uh are you there mahesh yes putting a hat on as a developer and i know you know uh, one of the one of the good things which we, we did by talking to you folks at sencop was that you know, you are a very uh, imaginative developer uh, do you see uh, markets beyond uh, just the discom uh, that for a concept like rdc or system friendly procurement do you see does it give more options to large uh, consumers to become more independent as far as the energy supply goes uh, yes definitely if you are going to meet uh the requirement uh, especially of large consumers when they need dispatchable power i won't say steady power but a dispatchable power uh definitely uh, it, it it would help uh, those consumers if we keep on developing these these products and especially if there are large consumers who, who require power almost around the clock and if renewable energy combined with either storage or oversizing or combining it with conventional generation can provide that at a cost which is possibly going to be competitive uh, i see a, a, a big market uh, opening up for for renewable energy power uh, if you are if you are going to solve these smaller uh, smaller issues thanks uh, thanks uh, thank you mahesh uh fabian uh, last question to you on my uh, round round of questions because i think we'll have to uh, start winding up soon uh, one of the things was that, that, that was mentioned by i think a couple of panelists and i think i know that you know the the demand curves are not going to be what they are today and we are securing for 25 years just because we have a life cycle of certain technologies as 25 years but as the markets are emerging evolving do you think there is a role for a short of pps uh, and the impact and then what would be the impact on the commercials that are going to be there the second part of it is have you seen any cases where uh, instead of going for a very long term ppa with a very uh, you know like you talked about the chili example where they they given the demand curve do you see a little more flexibility in the uh, system somewhere else and what has been the amp, you know the the amplitude of of the pricing there in terms of uh, you know maybe higher prices because you're you're building building in more flexibility to the contractual uh, aspects of the you know the uh, transaction yeah thanks so much um i think it, it is a very difficult balance we have to strike right on the one hand we want to project give developers some type of revenue certainty because we know that with with prices coming down actually the 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 share of of financing costs um, as 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 project um, cost us is simply getting bigger and bigger right so I think financing costs and the bankability of of offtake contracts is as important as never before um, on the other hand we there's a certain risk that if you lock lock in now lock in basically with 20 year power purchase agreements certain certain duration patterns that we might not want in 10 years from now we have a difficulty as well right so i think it's a really difficult balance to strike between somehow giving the developers some revenue certainty and at the other time at the other hand um making sure that uh, bidders have more kind of uh, the buyers have more um flexibility in terms of of, of um making sure that that generation is following demand I think, I mean, yeah, I think you mentioned uh, Chile, for example, which was just kind of trying to provide this this long term um, revenue certainty by actually fixing these supply blocks for a long time period of time. I think other alternatives are basically also if you have rather well functioning alternative markets, right? So, for example, if you have a wholesale market which is rather well functioning, then we see a case, for example, like in Denmark, where where developers say we actually don't need any um, any PPAs anymore with the government or with private producers, we simply only sell at the merchant market. I think there was a strong trend, particularly in Europe, we saw that there were, people expected that wholesale market prices would increase and therefore suddenly wholesale markets became much more attractive, the long-term PPAs, because often the revenues you could actually get at long-term wholesale markets were higher than the revenues you would get at, at PPAs. 
that trend has been reversed a bit now through the COVID-19 situation, right? I mean, with economic lockdowns, with, with the fear of, of, of economic recessions, um, wholesale market prices is also in countries where they were rather well developed, they sometimes dropped by 25%, 30%. And um, I think that's, of course, for, for, for bidders that are going after pure merchant projects, is rather challenging. So actually something interim, something where you basically have a bit shorter PPAs can be attractive, but they can only be attractive if the developers know that after a certain amount of, of, of years, when the PPA is over, they will still be able to sell the power. Um, something that actually I found very interesting in, in India, which uh, seems to be a, a, to be applied sometimes, is that some developers are now already ensuring that a certain share of their power is being delivered um, to, to um, through a PPA to the DISCO on a long-term offtake contract, to giving them some revenue certainty. And another share of the generation is basically sold freely at the, at the wholesale market, which currently is, which at least half a year ago, was quite attractive. So we might also be seeing situations where where developers are trying to get a certain revenue certainty by selling some of the power on rather like long-term offtake contracts and other parts of the power reacting more on short-term um, requirements. And I think that's something we can basically see that could be very attractive to India also if we have somehow have a system where where we have basically more flexibility through more offtake opportunities for developers. On the other hand, we still we are able to provide them with a certain revenue certainty by yeah, taking off part of the power on long-term price. And over to you. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Now I will uh, just take a couple of uh, questions from the uh, audience, if that's okay. And one of the questions I have uh, from a very old uh, and respected uh, renewable energy storage player. I think this is, uh, this is for uh, Mr. Mishra and uh, Abhishek Ji. Uh, the question is, could you clarify if the RTC tenders are leading to deployment of dispatchable RE? What is the pre preference of discounts between firm peaking power tenders versus RTC tenders, given that many discounts already have long-term contracts signed for meeting their uh, base demand curve? And what is what are they going to do with the surplus power uh, available during the off-peak periods? This RTC tender has been especially designed for uh, on the demand of the discount. It has not been uh, open for the market. This tender has been already uh, based on some discount requirements. So this, uh, if is, you see the requirement of the DTNA, it is a flat demand throughout the day because most of the load is industrial load. There is no variation at all. So right. they, they are already some 200 megawatt. They, their uh, time is over for one plant. They do, they in place of that, they have taken this. So this for a specific requirement, they have asked for this. Right, sir. Any thoughts, sir? sir you know, there's this uh, this thing, I, I know it's it's for the developer to manage this uh, issue of, uh, you know, the sizing of the project. But there are uh, chances that to meet the requirements of the uh, of the contract, they would be oversizing their, uh, 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 their plants. And there's going to be, especially in peak periods, you know, peak solar periods, like, you know, during the summers, uh, somewhere around noon, there's going to be excess power available, and that power, of course, the the first thing is from a project point of view, it's going to get into the uh, go into the trading market. But then, as this uh, size of these tenders in, in increases or other solar comes in, do you see a huge glut coming in uh, to the market, especially when you're looking at it from the time value of solar? And uh, are there any thoughts on how uh, uh, what these implications will be? Just your thoughts. I mean, I know you, those are not something that you can uh, deliberate much on, but your initial thoughts. Yeah, but this uh, um, this basically extra power, what they are going to generate uh, because of the oversizing, that the tender allows them to sell to the market. While bidding, uh, during the bidding, they must have evaluated all these things. And accordingly, they have given the final rates to us. So this uh, and connectivity they are getting getting as per the plan they are uh, connecting to the different station. So I don't think there is any issue selling to the market and they must have evaluated on that aspect. The renew can tell better on this. Absolutely, sir. Uh, Abhishek ji, any thoughts on uh, you know specifically the, the question that was there in terms of the uh, difference or the preference for RTC versus uh, you know specific peaking power that uh, you would want. No, uh, Rani, uh, there could be an optimal mix of both the things. It's not a question at all. So uh, today I'll, I'll tell you what is happening. The problem with us is 
the way like delhi for example if you take delhi as an example the if you take the variability in the load it is very very high on a daily and a seasonal time now banking was an option to optimize that but then of late what we have seen is banking slot wise is not available it is only rtc so today also if you imagine uh, today we are sitting in june we due to the weather vagaries we are both selling as well as purchasing in the exchange on day head basis i mean damn and uh, this is due to the peculiar nature that the minimum technical limit of the conventional coal based resources and the optimal mix as per my portfolio the pps data we have signed is forcing me to do that now with the upcoming uh, tenders like rtc and the peking power both kinds of flavors are available from seki's portfolio uh, we can have a suitable mix which optimizes on a the surplus during the off peak periods where i am today forced to sell on the exchange at a rate which is lower than many a times which is uh, lower than the rate of procurement b rtc in true terms we will see uh, as mishra sir also said i mean as per the requirement the rtc also what kind of cuf because the renewable power now which is no longer being seen when we are talking about the firmness and the variability has to be catered to when we talk about that aspect we are also looking at renewable power as a power resource not only as a rpo resource renewable purchase obligation so only cuf will not solve the issue so cuf is uh, i know in the back end it is tied up with the firm kilowatt or megawatt capacity as well so yes to answer your query a suitable mix of portfolio both the rtc flavor as well as peking power flavor will be suitable for the city like delhi I and mean, the ratio could vary from state to state depending upon the demand curve b a very important fact which has come up too and we are also facing the challenge what people are saying or even the regulator might be saying i'm not sure uh to meet your power and rpo obligation renewable purchase obligation there are two ways a you you have this dispatchable renewable energy power source b why don't you go for a conventional coal based uh, source plus rec so which is more competitive in terms of price because both ways you are going to get some kind of firmness so that is another aspect we have to see when we are designing such kind of contracts uh, especially now that uh, there is some regulation from crc they have said that 1 rupee per unit is the ceiling tariff for uh, rec non solar and solar both so that is also another round, uh, round of opportunity as a challenge that we have to see so i am in favor like for example if we have a dispatchable re and that to price competitive nothing like that so anything which is over and above conventional non clean sources even if the non clean sources are cheaper is better but now that uh, one step is already achieved that grid parity of the pure vanilla re is there the next challenge is to make the dispatchable rec or grid parity so grid parity could be one of the definition could be <clears throat> at what rate this conventional power is available plus rec i'll pause here from right sir thank you abhishek ji thank you mr vishal uh, thank you for those insights and i think uh, uh, i can i can just to sum up i think i think we we are really out of time we we exceeded not only the uh, time limit set for our panel discussion but i think the time limit set for the webinar so i think uh, we are now impinging into other people's uh, time for meetings so i think we we'll wrap up this panel discussion uh, i'd like to uh, say only one thing that you know when we came into this webinar and we started designing it we thought that there would be a next number of issues but let me tell you having talked to you there are maybe x plus y number of issues and a lot more possibilities and opportunities as well so i think this is going to be a fascinating topic of discussion going forward as the next one or two years i would like to thank seki for bringing this wonderful concept uh, uh, up there i would like to thank the developers uh, the new and semcorp for actually providing their insights those were really really uh, very very uh, quality based uh, insights and i really like to thank surbi and uh, fabian for their uh, you know coming in from uh, a lenders perspective and and a researchers perspective and giving us uh, you know how how to take it forward and of course abhishek ji bringing in the you know the, the perpetual player in the games uh, point of view which is uh, the discom uh, so with this uh, i would like to thank all the panelists tell uh, 
and, and uh, you know basically let them know that I think they have done a very very good job of actually clarifying a lot of these issues that uh, a number of people would uh, have uh, in terms of how this market develops and proceeds. Uh, on that note, I will uh, hand over the uh, the rest of the, uh, uh, the the moderation of this uh, session to Yogita. Yogita, take it forward, please. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for the great discussion we all had here on this platform. Uh, with this, now we come to an end of this webinar, and I would like to invite Dr. Rakesh Goel, he's the team leader, PhD program, and the vice president, uh, Data Tech India office, to give his concluding remarks. Thank you, Yogita, and good afternoon, everybody. So, as a concluding remark, there are three roles to be played: thanking everybody, summing the discussion and telling about what is coming next, which I will do very briefly within the time limits. So first of all, start with the thanks. So we are very thankful to the USAID, Mr. Michael Satin and Mr. Anurag Mishra for guiding us and encouraging us to conduct this webinar on this very upcoming and important topic of RTC. We are thankful to esteemed panelists who have taken out time from their busy schedule and contributed in this webinar with their thought leadership and vast sector experiences. And as Rodi pointed out, we have more issues to deal with it, not just what we thought of. We are thankful to the participants who participated in large number, 128, 128, who joined this webinar, shared their questions, which will help us in terms of deciding the next course of action. And all those questions which we could not answer because of the paucity of time, let me assure them that we will take them and one to one basis will respond to them as well. As. Regarding the summary of this webinar covered many things. What is RTC? Why RTC? What are global experience? Why it is relevant for India? And if you like to sum up all the learnings of a webinar, I like to say the RE procurement design can help in reducing the system integration cost. ISCOM should make use of it by choosing the model that best suited to them. We discussed in the webinar several models, but there can be also many other models which ISCOMs may like to develop based on their own requirement. It is a low hanging fruit. USAID, not only in India, but in several other countries, also supporting RE procurement auctions. And to share all the learnings, a compendium is developed, which will be called Toolkit, which is going to be released next month. The details are provided on the slide, which has been presented here. So look out for those platform, which are mentioned on the page D and where that will be available for that. Thank you once again and goodbye. Yogita, anything uh, last from your side? Um, uh, we'll be, uh, thank you all. Uh, we'll be sharing the recording of this webinar on our website as well as uh, uh, on, on the social media handles. All the presentations will be available on our website. So by late evening today, we'll be uploading everything on uh, these uh, digital platforms. Thank you, everyone. Uh, you can hang up now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm.